at uh, the University of uh, Ljubljana at the Faculty for Mathematics and Physics. And then after that, this was in 2007, and then after that, he did a postdoc at the uh, University of Göttingen in Germany with uh, the late Professor Thomas Kruschke. That was in 2008. But right after that, he went back to Ljubljana, to the uh, University of uh, Ljubljana, where he was appointed in 2012 as an assistant professor. And since 2017, he's an associate professor at uh, the, the Faculty for uh, Mathematics and Physics at the University of uh, Ljubljana. And today he's going to talk, uh, which he's going to tell us about the uh, tensor network approach to calculating subgap states. So thank you very much, Rock, for uh, accepting the invitation and uh, you may start. Yeah, well, uh, thank you for inviting me. So it's a great pleasure uh, to give this talk. Um, so I will indeed present a new non-perturbative method for calculating the subgap states in hybrid devices, but um, maybe I should immediately make two comments. Uh, the first one is that if you are wondering what are the subgap states and what are the hybrid devices, that will become clear in just a moment. And the second thing is that maybe the title sounds very technical, but um, this will actually not be a, a technical talk, it will be mostly about physics. Uh, but we, it will be about physics in a regime which was not uh, accessible before simply because there was no theoretical tool uh, to address it. And uh, uh, the goal here is to present this tool and uh, to show you some of the results that we were able to obtain. Okay, so uh, the hybrid devices that I, will, I was mentioning, mentioning are actually uh, hybrid devices which uh, incorporate a semiconducting region as well as a superconducting region. And uh, if this seems familiar to you, uh, then that is probably because these type of devices are uh, nowadays commonly used as a platform for exploring topological superconductivity, uh, also in the context of searching for Majorana zero modes. Now, uh, more specifically, the device that uh, we had in mind in this project uh, is the following one. Uh, so, it's, again, it's uh, an indium arsenide uh, quantum wire uh, with a shell made out of uh, superconducting material. But in addition to that, uh, this device has a number of finger electrodes, which makes it extremely tunable. And uh, thanks to this tunability, it's possible to uh, electrostatically define two regions along this uh, uh, nanowire. One region is essentially a small quantum dot where one traps a small number of electrons, uh, so essentially a single electron so that this region will behave as a magnetic impurity. And in the other region we trap a small, well, uh, intermediately large number of electrons uh, so that we obtain a uh, a superconductor, uh, which is kind of small in the sense that uh, the electron number is here perhaps in the thousands, tens of thousands. So uh, there is enough of electrons so that it's still possible to uh, speak about superconductivity in a meaningful way. Uh, but at the same time, it's possible to control the number of electrons in this region electrostatically. Uh, so uh, the effects of mesoscopic physics and Coulomb blockade uh, can be felt also in this region. Uh, now, the, since this is very tunable device, it's actually possible to obtain very different kinds of behavior. Uh, so there's a, there's a large range of parameters here. So one simplest possibility is that uh, there would be no superconductivity and also the charging energy for this region would be very small so that uh, this area would actually be uh, a small piece of metal. And if that, that is the case, this is actually a realization of the Kondo uh, model. And in this case, you would expect to have a uh, uh, many body Kondo resonance at the Fermi level. Now, the other possibility is that uh, this region is superconducting, in which case there is a spectral gap in the system. Uh, but as is well known, uh, a magnetic impurity will induce uh, subgap states uh, in such a device. So what we expect uh, is then is to see a, a symmetric pair of uh, spectral peaks. Uh, so it's symmetric with respect to the Fermi level. 
within the superconducting gap. That, that's another possibility. Then uh, another limit is that uh, we, would, we could have a system with no superconductivity but uh, sizable charging energy, which would open a gap. Uh, so this would no longer be just a simple metal. Uh, but also in this case, one can obtain subgap states uh, of a different nature. And finally, uh, it's possible to have both. So it's uh, in, in this kind, in this set of devices, devices, it is possible to have uh, superconductivity as well as a sizable charging energy. And then the gap uh, has kind of mixed character. It's due to both superconductivity and to the uh, uh, repulsion between the electrons. And in fact, uh, it can get even more complicated than that because uh, this charging parameter U for the quantum dot part of the device uh, is not necessarily very large. And in fact, uh, one can also consider the regime where this parameter U is small, and this would correspond to the limit of Andreyev bound states. And it so happens that actually our the uh, the device that was studied uh, in collaboration with the experimental group from Copenhagen is such that uh, it's it's far away from all of these limits, yeah. And for this particular reason, it means that it's not possible to study this device just by going to one of these limits and uh, using uh, some appropriate approximations. But instead, one really needs to keep in uh, to take into account all of the competing interactions. And the thing is that until very recently, there was simply no good method to uh, study this class of uh, systems. Okay, so after this longish introduction, uh, uh, let me just give you the outline of this talk. So the first thing that I plan to do is to give a, a quick refresher on the superconductivity and what magnetic impurities do uh, to, a, uh, to a VCS state. Then I will tell you what is different when superconductors become very small and how we model this kind of devices. And finally, we get to the main subject of this talk, uh, which is a coupled quantum dot uh, to a superconducting island and the question of how it is that we are able to solve this kind of Hamiltonians. And then I, I will describe uh, uh, the most important physical effects that we were uh, able to find in these devices. And then uh, just briefly before I finish, I will give a short perspective on more complex devices where uh, a quantum dot is actually coupled to uh, two semi uh, superconducting regions. And uh, this has some interesting uh, implications for being able to study the two channel uh, version of the of condo systems. Okay, so uh, here we are talking about conventional superconductors, uh, which are well described by the BCS theory. So uh, this is well known by now. So the attractive interaction is induced uh, due to the electron phonon coupling. Uh, the Fermi surface is unstable towards formation of Cooper pairs, uh, which condense into a superconducting states. And the important thing for our purposes is that uh, since many Cooper pairs overlap in space, it turns out that mean field theory is actually an excellent approximation uh, for this kind of uh, simple superconductors. So basically, uh, uh, for most of our purposes, the BCS uh, reduced Hamiltonian uh, is perfectly sufficient to understand most of the physics. Now, the excitations uh, in these systems uh, can be easily obtained because this is uh, a quadratic Hamiltonian which can be uh, easily diagonalized and uh, the excitations which obtain are known as the Bogolyubo quasi-particles. So these are essentially uh, uh, states uh, which are a linear superposition of particle creation and particle annihilation operators. And uh, the spectrum of this is such that uh, there is a spectral gap. Uh, which has some value, uh, which we uh, call delta. And also uh, this corresponding gap is nicely visible uh, in tunneling spectroscopy experiments. So there are indeed hardly any states in this region. Yeah? Uh, and uh, a good super superconductor has what is now known as a hard gap. So uh, a well-defined uh, sharp edges uh, like seen in this example.
Okay, and uh, yeah, uh, also very early uh, after the discovery of superconductors, it was noticed that uh, superconductivity and magnetism are in some sense antagonistic. And one manifestation of that was that uh, if you take a superconducting material and you dope it with magnetic impurities, uh, it's actually very easy to destroy uh, superconductivity uh, at very low doping levels. And then uh, in 1950s, this was uh, this started to be studied more systematically. And one, what they discovered uh, was that the suppression of superconductivity is directly related to the spin of the impurities. So uh, these are some uh, results from an experiment where they controllably dope uh, a superconductor with the same concentration, uh, but of uh, using different dopants. And the suppression, suppression was largest for gadolinium, which has the highest spin. Uh, and the other observation was that the superconducting transition decreases linearly as the concentration, which led people to believe that uh, this effect can be studied uh, from the starting from a single impurity problem. And uh, essentially, the corresponding Hamiltonian uh, is easy to devise. So you just take the BCS Hamiltonian, you put one spin at the origin and you couple this spin uh, through exchange coupling to the spin density of electrons at that position. And this essentially is the condom model, um, but uh, it's a condom model with superconducting bath. And uh, remember that this was late 1950s. Uh, so uh, at that point, people kind of already realized that this is a, a, a non-trivial many body problem, but there were, there were no good uh, methods yet to solve it. Uh, so what they did uh, is to take the classical limit. So it, you say that spin is large and uh, coupling is small so that uh, the product of these two uh, has a finite value and this defines some parameter alpha. And then this model becomes, uh, well, uh, the Hamiltonian becomes a quadratic Hamiltonian, which again can be uh, diagonalized exactly. And what they found, uh, uh, actually in three papers independently roughly in the same period is that one of the, so some linear combination of Bogolubo excitations uh, becomes uh, uh, a bound state. So it detaches from the continuum and it enters uh, this uh, subgap region. And the spectroscopic manifestation of these excitations uh, is that uh, you get some sharp peaks uh, within the gap. Now, interestingly, uh, so this is parameterized by this quantity alpha, and you see that this, quant uh, this, uh, this binding energy will change sign when alpha becomes equal to 1. Uh, so what happens at this point is that uh, this, uh, this bound state actually becomes uh, populated. And uh, a, a kind of pictorial interpretation of that is that uh, a Bogolubo quasi particle gets bound uh, to the impurity spin. And uh, as a matter of speaking, uh, it screens the, impur the total impurity spin from uh, some large number S to a value reduced by one half. Yeah? And uh, Sakurai was quick to point out that uh, this actually corresponds to uh, quantum phase transition. So there are two many body uh, states which compete to be the ground state of the system and they actually cross at this particular point. Okay, so this was a, a classical approximation uh, which is valid in the limit of infinite spin. And it actually took a while for people to develop, uh, let's say, reliable unbiased methods to solve this problem. And uh, this was successfully done uh, uh, no earlier than in 1990s. And uh, at that point, uh, they were able to solve this problem uh, without approximation using the numerical rare normalization group, NRG. And uh, what they found was that the basic phenomenology is pretty much the same. Uh, so again, uh, there is some bound state, uh, or maybe in this context, it's better to speak about uh, many body states. So th there are two many body states. One is uh, spin singlet and another one is the spin doublet. 
So for small coupling, uh, it's the doublet which is the ground state, so the impurity remains magnetic. But then the singlet state, state is decreasing in energy, and at some point uh, the two states cross, and from that point on uh, the impurity is basically compensated by again by binding uh, Bogolyubo quasi particle. So uh, the differences with respect to the classical model uh, are kind of subtle, but they do exist and they are important. Uh, and the, the, the main difference uh, regards the uh, degeneracy. Uh, so uh, this doublet state actually is a true quantum mechanical doublet. Uh, so it, ha it corresponds to two states. And in, in, another thing is that in the true solution of the model, the SC2 spin symmetry is not broken, it's maintained. Uh, other than that, the differences are, all, are only quantitative. So uh, one quantitative difference is that the transition happens on the scale where the condo temperature uh, given by this formula uh, roughly corresponds to the superconducting gap. Okay. And, uh, yeah, and the method which was used uh, to solve this problem uh, as I mentioned before, is basically uh, the generalization of the numerical renormalization group, uh, which was originally dev uh, uh, devised for normal state, uh, but uh, to the superconducting case. And uh, nowadays, uh, there are open source implementations of that uh, with full support, not only for the normal state, but also for the superconducting. But and, uh, basically, this is now kind of the standard tool for studying uh, uh, problems in this class. And typically you find excellent agreement uh, between uh, experiment and theory after appropriate uh, parameter tuning. So th this method really has a very high predictive power. Now the only thing is that uh, this method really works when you're dealing with uh, large superconducting regions. So even in these uh, kind of tiny devices, it turns out that uh, this superconductor, uh, which is on the scale of micrometers, uh, is still large enough to be well described by the macroscopic approximation, so basically by the BCS theory. Uh, now here we are dealing with much smaller devices, uh, and in that case it turns out uh, that uh, e first you need uh, uh, a method which allows you to more appropriately describe the superconductor uh, with fixed charge. And you need to have a method which allows you to properly incorporate the charging energy terms. And it turns out that uh, an appropriate way to do that uh, is through describing the superconducting region using the so-called Richardson model, which I will now introduce. Uh, so this model was... Uh, kind of entered the uh, solid state physics in 1990s when people started to study uh, superconducting grain, grains. So uh, regions of uh, superconductors which were so small that uh, uh, basically you could resolve individual orbitals uh, in the system. Yeah. And uh, the essence of this uh, Hamiltonian is that uh, you write the superconducting Hamiltonian in the basis of orbitals. So this index i is just uh, uh, labeling the different uh, levels in the system. Uh, and then we, out of all the all of the interactions which are induced by the electron-electron interaction, we keep only those between the time reversal conjugate pairs. And this is actually fully in the spirit of the uh, BCS theory as devised by Bardin, Cooper, and Schrieffer. Uh, so uh, originally they, uh, they were using, uh, the, they devised the Hamiltonian, Hamiltonian in the momentum space. And there the time reversal conjugate pairs were, for, for instance, k uh, spin up and minus k spin down. Uh, whereas here the states can be more complicated because uh, we're dealing with some great grain which has no nice symmetries and uh, so basically you just need to first diagonalize the Hamiltonian in the uh, taking into account uh, the basically the, the disorder the grain boundaries etc etc and then as a second step you take into account the electron phonon interaction you 
project, uh, so you integrate out the phonon modes and uh, you would end up with a Hamiltonian of this type. Uh, the only thing is that, uh, in principle, the interaction would be, would depend on the level, so this uh, parameter alpha would really depend on indices i and j, uh, but we simplify that by assuming that uh, this is a constant. And, uh, so, we lose something through this uh, approximation, but it turns out that this is still good enough uh, to have descriptive power, and this, this is the Hamiltonian that people were using to account for the excitations in superconducting grains. Okay, and uh, yeah, in fact, it turns out that uh, the this model uh, has an exact solution, but funnily, uh, this was not known in the uh, condensed matter community. So, the exact same model was actually used in the context of nuclear physics, uh, and back in 1960s, uh, Richardson was able to find an exact solution. And the point is that uh, the levels which are singly occupied are completely inert. They don't do anything, so th they uh, just factor out, and that's because uh, uh, this interaction only couples levels which are either unoccupied or doubly occupied. Yeah? Uh, so, you can immediately split this problem into two sub-problems, so the trivial problem of single occupied levels, uh, which just have uh, what is known as the blocking effect, uh, because these levels are not able to participate in the pairing interaction, and all of the other levels which do indeed uh, uh, coupled through the pairing, and then uh, instead of writing the problem in the fermionic language, you can introduce the so-called hardcore boson operators, and then in this language, uh, this looks like a non-interacting problem. Uh, the only thing is that hardcore bosons do not really have uh, simple canonical commutations relations like uh, regular bosons would. Uh, but uh, Richardson found a way to uh, slightly correct the uh, wave function, uh, which then takes this form, and to find the coefficients uh, uppercase e alpha, one needs to solve the following eigenvalue equation, but this is a relatively straightforward uh, set of algebraic equations, uh, which one can solve. Uh, I mean, the, one has to be careful, and these solutions uh, with increasing parameter alpha uh, have a rather complex behavior, so these co coefficients will uh, become complex at some point, and you need to uh, keep them in pairs uh, to get a final solution, but uh, with some programming effort you can find a solver for that, and uh, find an exact solution uh, to the full problem, uh, basically up to uh, uh, numerical round of errors. Now, one thing that I should point out uh, is that Richardson model uh, for large number of levels and uh, when alpha is small, uh, uh, actually f is fully equivalent to the BCS uh, system uh, with the same set of excitations, so uh, uh, you get Bogolubo states, uh, but it is more general so, it allows you to go to the uh, regime of smaller uh, system sizes, which is relevant for the superconducting grains, or you can take the limit of large alpha, uh, which allows you to describe the transition between uh, BCS and BEC, so Bose-Einstein condensate, uh, so it is more general. Uh, but for our purposes, uh, the more important point is that it allows us to keep an easier track of the charge, and uh, also then it allows us to uh, more, in a simple way, to incorporate the charging term. Uh, so, as I mentioned uh, in the beginning, uh, a very important element of physics here is that we are able to control the occupancy uh, in this uh, superconducting region, and this happens through uh, this kind of term. So, uh, parameter N0 is basically the gate voltage Vs on this electrode in some uh, suitable uh, uh, units of charge. And then, uh, in the absence of the quantum dot, uh, this would be the uh, 
kind of the energy diagram of the system. So depending on uh, this parameter, uh, you would be on a different uh, charge branch. And uh, here I'm taking an example where the charging energy is less, uh, lower than uh, gap. Uh, and here you see that uh, all of the odd number branches are higher in energy by delta and they can never be a ground state of the system. Uh, but if you would be increasing EC, you would see that uh, when EC is larger than delta, actually uh, this can also become a possible ground state of the system for suitable tuning of n uh close to the odd integer values. And I will show you examples of that in the following. Okay, so uh, putting everything together, uh, this is our Hamiltonian. So we have our uh, Anderson impurity, uh, so uh, with energy epsilon uh, and electron-electron uh, repulsion U. And we will just write this in the following form. So this, this parameter nu is basically just, uh, uh, is basically the same as epsilon, but in some suitable units uh, so that it quantifies the kind of the uh, favored number of electrons on the quantum dot. Uh, for the superconductor, as I already told you, we take the Richardson Hamiltonian and we add the charging term on top of that. And again, uh, N0 is a parameter which uh, specifies the favored number of electrons in the superconducting region. And then we couple the two regions together uh, through a coupling Hamiltonian, so uh, just particle hopping, and we parameter parameterize this in terms of hybridization gamma. Okay, so now the question is how to solve the whole thing. So, uh, first of all, uh, it should be mentioned that energy cannot be applied to this class of Hamiltonians. Uh, so there, there is something called the charge tracking trick, uh, which applies to uh, cases where there is no uh, gap, but we are not able to apply this in, uh, in uh, this trick in this situation because it leads to spurious states which one cannot remove from the spectrum. Uh, also, another possibility would be uh, to do a mean field decompositions to parts of the Hamiltonian, but it turns out uh, that at the end of the day, uh, this does not allow you to solve this problem uh, without further approximations. and. Uh, since we are interested in the parameter regimes where all of the uh, all of the elements are important, uh, basically uh, that is not a good way to proceed. But on the other hand, uh, what we realized is that uh, it is possible to write this Hamiltonian uh, in a product form. So it's possible to define uh, this kind of uh, matrices and well. Uh, so they're, they're mostly of, most of them are uh, of dimension nine by nine, but at the edges of the system, we have uh, one by nine and nine by one, uh, basically uh, vectors. And if you multiply out all of these matrices, uh, you will recover the original Hamiltonian that we were uh, discussing before. Now, the reason why this is important uh, is because uh, this allows us to solve this problem using uh, the MRG approach in the matrix product uh, state uh, uh, language. So uh, our Hamiltonian takes uh, this form. Uh, so I will not really go into the intricacies of uh, DMRG. Uh, the only thing is that I want to tell here is that this Hamiltonian is really easily implementable uh, in this language. And uh, then the whole uh, goal here is to basically optimize uh, the matrix product states uh, uh, in such a way to find the minimal energy uh, for this system. Now, it's not obviously clear that uh, this is a good idea and that this works well because this Hamiltonian actually has uh, long range interactions uh, and uh, this typically could lead to problems uh, in DMRG. So it's very important that uh, one validates the method. Uh, so there's a number of possible issues here. Uh, one, of course, the trivial thing is that uh, one could just uh, mess things up and uh, not implement uh, this uh, correctly. But then all, even if this is correctly implemented, it could uh, 
not converge at all or one could get stuck in some metastable states. And also a final question is, uh, does this really scale well with the system size? And how do the numerical requirements increase? And uh, typically this is a concern for Hamiltonian, uh, like this one, which basically has all-to-all -all interaction. And uh, so first to verify that the implementation itself is correct, uh, we compared it against exact diagonalization for small n of order uh, like 10. And uh, this, uh, uh, we were able to show that uh, we get exactly the same results. One can also compare against exact Richardson solution uh, when gamma, so when the quantum dot is decoupled, uh, and again, uh, we get a perfect agreement. And finally, in the absence of EC, it's possible to test against numerical normalization group, but then this takes a bit of effort because uh, energy is really working in the thermodynamic limit where the Richardson Hamiltonian becomes fully equivalent to the BCS mean field solution. Uh, so we need to study uh, the system for a range of uh, sizes and do uh, an extrapolation to infinite size limit. Uh, and when we do that, uh, we can show that uh, the differences are indeed very small, so on the few percent level, which is typically also the accuracy uh, that one can expect to obtain in energy. And uh, so we were quite happy and uh, this gave us good confidence that what we are doing is correct and that uh, the solutions that we obtain for arbitrary uh, parameters is indeed correct. And using that, uh, we started to study the system uh, with increasing uh, charging energy. So now I will show uh, uh, a series of kind of phase diagrams in the plane of hybridization strength and n naught. So remember that n naught is the number of electrons uh, in the superconducting region. Uh, so here for this set of calculations, we choose uh, 800 levels uh, in the superconducting region and also we're putting 800 uh, electrons in this region. So uh, this superconductor is half filled. Uh, but the main question is what happens as a function of, uh, of the, of, so when we try to tune the number of electrons in this region. And uh, when this is very small, of course, uh, this, uh, nothing happens in the vertical direction, but instead we recover the physics uh, very, well, very well known from the energy solution. So with increasing uh, gamma, uh, yeah, may maybe I should mention that here we take the limit of very large U and also we put a single electron in the quantum dot. So basically this thing behaves as a, uh, as a, as a quantum impurity. And we know that for some value of j or for the corresponding value of gamma, uh, we will just uh, find uh, the well-known doublet to singlet transition. And that's exactly what we find. Then we turn on uh, a sizable EC, but still lower than delta. And we see that uh, we obtain a di diagram which is uh, seems similar, but the boundary now becomes dependent uh, on the gate voltage applied to the superconductor. And actually this is quite easy to understand. So the EC terms uh, in this region will favor the, the state with 800 electrons. And because there's an extra electron on the quantum dot, uh, this corresponds to favoring the doublet region. And indeed the doublet region uh, will grow larger uh, compared to the singlet region. And here it's the opposite. So here, uh, the charging energy favors the state with 801 electrons on the superconductor and there's an extra electron so this means that uh, we are favoring the singlet region uh, which grows larger and in fact uh, it turns out uh, that for large u limit uh, this is actually an excellent approximation so we can just uh, take the binding energy for for instance from the energy calculation and we uh, incorporate the charging energy at uh, this very rough mean field level without even doing any self-consistency uh, uh, for the mean field loop. And uh, we would get basically the same diagram. And then uh, we increase to larger EC and then something, uh, actually uh, the different, the change happens when EC becomes the same as delta. 
uh, namely the, the connectivity of this diagram, or if you want, the topology changes. So here, uh, this, uh, this boundary uh, was kind of vertical with some zigzag shape. Uh, but when E is larger than delta, actually these lines become kind of tend to become hori increasingly horizontal, and the separation between uh, different spin regions uh, is dominantly controlled by the number of electrons on the superconductor, uh, especially uh, for large E C. Yeah. So, for instance, uh, uh, in this region, when when there is an even number of electrons on the superconductor. Uh, it's actually no longer possible to fully screen the impurity spin, irrespective of the value of the hybridization. Okay, and uh, so we can now collect all of these diagrams together uh, for a range of EC values, and we indeed see that this difference occurs uh, as EC crosses the value of 1. And also we can plot this uh, in different planes, so we can plot it in the gamma EC plane, uh, for different values of n naught, and indeed we see that something happens at value of one. Yeah? So this is the characteristic uh, value for this problem. And then uh, we can also study what what happens when we are not in the uh, deep condo limit. So we can reduce value of u. Uh, we can go to u. So this is still condo limit, but not very deep limit. And we see some small. Uh, uh, mostly qualitative changes and we can then reduce it even further and uh, we can see that uh, now the quantitative differences are uh, rather large. Uh, so uh, yeah, maybe I should mention that for this parameter uh, we could call it uh, a realistic case because this corresponds to the actual value in the experimental system. Okay, but now more importantly, when u is uh, smaller, it's also interesting to see what happens when we go away from the half filling point. And actually, this will be the regime where the uh, the effects of the charging will become the most pronounced. And now this is an example of such a calculation. Uh, so for increasing EC, we go from the regime uh, where this uh, charging did not uh, play any role. Uh, and now we plot the results in the plane of uh, both uh, both uh, gate voltages. So this is new. So this is the horizontal direction. So this is the number of electrons on the quantum dot. And the vertical direction is the voltage applied to the superconductor. So this one is controlling the number of electrons uh, in this region. And you see that uh, in the extreme uh, Coulomb blockade limit, so when EC is much larger than, de than delta, one recovers the typical uh, uh, square or honeycomb. Well, it would be honeycomb diagram, and I will show you some later uh, th that you find uh, in, for instance, in double quantum dot systems. Uh, but in this intermediate region, we obtain more complex diagrams, and indeed the states that we obtain for this parameter range are neither Yushi Balusino states nor. Uh, states characteristic for uh, just pure Coulomb blockade systems, but uh, some states which have kind of mixed character. Uh, so some combination of Yushiba Rusuno states, Andrea bound states, and uh, Coulomb states. And I, I will show you in the following uh, some comparisons uh, uh, to just emphasize that uh, they really are different. And uh, yeah, and uh, Indeed, uh, then we use this tool to compare against actual experimental measurements in these systems. So this is now an experimental phase diagram as a function of uh, gate voltages on the uh, on the electrodes, which I denoted as. Uh, well, do I have a figure? Well, so basically, this direction is controlling the number of electrons on the quantum dot, and this one on the superconductor, and then we uh, we kind of juxtapose the experimental figure with uh, these uh, transparent uh, blue lines, which actually correspond uh, to the white lines in this, uh, in this diagram. So the white lines are actually the point where the subgap states crosses the Fermi level. And this is when the device becomes more conductive. And this is exactly what experimentalists are able to measure. And indeed, uh, with some parameter tuning, we are able to recover uh, this phase diagram. And it turns out that EC 
is actually very close to delta. It's something like uh, 0 0.9. Uh, but it also turns out that this device also has some charge-charge uh, repulsion, so some capacitive coupling between the superconductor and the quantum dot. And in that case, the phase boundary is actually shifted to somewhat lower EC values. So this actually already corresponds to the regime where you can have uh, also an odd number of electrons on the superconductor. Okay, and then uh, the question is uh, how, what kind of spectral manifestations does that have? And uh, again, using this method, we can study how the excitation spectra evolve. So this would be the typical, uh, so for EC0, uh, one obtains uh, typical shapes which have this kind of ring or uh, some people also call this uh, eye-shaped uh, and this is uh, what would typically be uh, experimentally observed in uh, devices with uh, large bulk superconductors. But then, uh, at even for EC values which are relatively small, so for instance, half the value of the gap, uh, you would see that uh, these spectra become very asymmetric, especially away from the particle hole symmetric point. Yeah? So, uh, the excitation energy for adding one electron is much lower than the excitation energy for removing one electron from the device. And if you keep on increasing this parameter, eventually you will get uh, sharp lines, which are actually characteristic uh, of uh, qu double quantum dot devices in deep uh, Coulomb blockade limit. Yeah? Uh, but of course, the spectra will depend also on the tuning uh, in the in the superconductor, and it turns out that for odd tuning, uh, uh, for the same EC value, uh, these Coulomb blockade effects are felt less strongly, so there, there will still be some curvature. Uh, so it gets a bit uh, complex here. Uh, but the po important thing is that we, if we actually compute the spectra for the same parameters uh, that we uh, extracted from the comparison of these phase diagrams, we actually are able to reproduce the, uh, phys uh, the experimental excitation spectrum. And uh, th this is strongly non-trivial, uh, because this means that with the same set of parameters, we're actually able to reproduce two very different kinds of measurements. Uh, and, uh, well, with without showing the figures, I can also mention that we are also able to reproduce the trends uh, uh, for the level shifts uh, when uh, they apply the magnetic field. Okay, maybe this, uh, this can serve uh, as a kind of uh, summary figure uh, for this part uh, of the talk. So, uh, this is the, these are the actual experimental results and these are the, well, th these are not actually uh, experimental but uh, are the, no, Actually, no, these are, sorry, so these are the theoretical results and these are uh, for the, uh, uh, the phase diagram and these are the theoretical results for the excitation spectrum uh, computed for the actual set of parameters that we uh, obtained by fitting. Uh, but then the question is how much different this would be, for instance, in the absence of superconductivity or in the absence of the charging energy. and. Uh, you can clearly see that uh, we would obtain very different uh, both uh, both phase diagrams and the excitation spectra. Uh, and so the point is that this regime of what we now call Coulombic subgap states is indeed recognizably different from both limits of uh, just pure Coulomb interaction and the limit of pure uh, uh, well, superconductivity without any charging. So when one only has Yoshino, Shibarusino physics where only the exchange interaction is important. Uh, so to sum up, so these Coulombic subgap states uh, really depend on the presence of both uh, exchange interaction between the Bulgolubo uh, particles and the uh, magnetic, so the spin on the uh, quantum dot, and also on the charge repulsion. Okay, and uh, now in the remaining time, I will show you some uh, 
some early ideas about an, well, ideas and also already some uh, results for the two channel devices and uh, the, the, the point is that uh, this, this kind of devices uh, were already used uh, early on but in the absence of superconductivity as a way of physically implementing the two channel condom model. Uh, the thing is that uh, when you have an Anderson impurity, uh, which is a, a suitable model from a realistic quantum dot, it turns out that irrespective of how many uh, different uh, uh, channels, contacts you attach it with, that will always correspond uh, in the end to a single channel uh, condo model. That's simply because there is always some linear combination of states from the different channels which couple to the impurity while all of the other ones are decoupled. And uh, the way to get away from this uh, difficulty is to add one way, in one way or another, some energy penalty for transferring the electrons to uh, one of the channels. And uh, one way to do that uh, clearly is to uh, have a region of the system where it costs some uh, Coulomb energy to transfer the electrons to. to and that, that simply are uh, quantum dots which are large enough uh, to still have like a quasi-continuum of excitations, but uh, they will be gapped by energy EC. Yeah? And this was first implemented around 2007 uh, uh, to, for the first time, experimentally demonstrate uh, a system which behaves uh, according to the uh, two-channel condo Hamiltonian. Uh, yeah, and the, the idea is, uh, can we study the same thing, uh, but in the situation when we have superconductivity in the contacts? And indeed, uh, yeah, as you can imagine, it's quite feasible to, uh, with modern technology, to implement this kind of de devices. And uh, this was uh, been done uh, uh, some months ago. Uh, this is the actual physical device. And these are some early examples of the phase diagram. So these are shown in the plane of uh, the gate voltage, which controls the charge number on the quantum dot. And so this one is the voltage on uh, electrode on the left, and this is electrode on the right. And this demonstrates that it is indeed possible uh, to tune the electron numbers in these devices. Now. Now we jump back to theory and uh, the question is uh, what really happens in the two-channel condo Hamiltonian uh, when the contacts are superconducting? And uh, we have studied this uh, some uh, years ago in collaboration with Michele Fabrizio and the results are actually extremely interesting. Uh, first, it turns out that um, uh, as opposed to the single-channel condo model, uh, where there was a single uh, singlet excitation which was decreasing in energy. In this problem, we actually have two of them. Yeah? And uh, if the couplings are symmetric, uh, these two excitations are exactly degenerate, but even a small uh, breaking of the coupling will uh, just split uh, these two excitations in energy and they can be observed uh, independently. That's one thing. Now, the other thing uh, is perhaps even more interesting, uh, and namely that there is an additional doublet state in this problem. Uh, and you can imagine that this, the, the, the origin of this doublet state is some kind of condo overscreening uh, by uh, two Bogoliubo quasi-particles binding to the single uh, impurity screen. So, uh, in other words, it, it's a bit like forming a Heisenberg chain uh, between the two uh, uh, Bogolibo quasi particles in either uh, of the uh, two superconductors and the spin on the impurity level. And with increasing coupling, this state actually decreases in energy uh, and uh, in the limit of very strong coupling can uh, even become the ground state of the system. And interestingly, uh, there's a duality between the weak coupling and strong coupling limits of this problem. 
and at some point the two uh, states cross and actually this is the most non-trivial uh, regime of the problem which actually corresponds to the non-fermi liquid fixed point which is known from the normal state uh, version of the two-channel condo model and uh, actually finally there are even some uh, vestiges of the non-fermi liquid fixed point uh, in this problem even though we uh, open the gap the gap and uh, the way to see that is that uh, irrespective for, of the value of uh, j parameter that you choose in this Hamiltonian, if you reduce the gap value, uh, you will actually move towards this self-dual point. So, uh, uh, these two energy levels will always converge to some universal value, uh, which has, uh, well, well, this parameter has this value, uh, which is accurate to all of these digits of precision. And um, if you are a bit familiar with uh, multi-channel condo models, maybe you know that uh, these models have uh, uh, basically singular physical behavior in the limit of, uh, well, in the low energy limit, uh, and those uh, those uh, power law uh, scalings are characterized characterized by some non-trivial exponents. And the point is that uh, what, what we basically uncovered is that uh, this non-trivial exponent in the non-fermi liquid fixed point uh, for a model which has uh, conformal invariance symmetry uh, map into some uh, characteristic values uh, for the sub-gap states uh, in, the, in the limit of small gap. Okay, so maybe this was a bit technical. Uh, the only thing is that now all of these predictions were made for the two-channel condom model, and the question is how does this map for the Anderson model? So uh, Anderson model in the presence of charging energy. So th that's the question. So if there's any hope to observe this kind of physics, we really need to return to the more realistic approximation of the problem. So this would be the Anderson impurity coupled to two small uh, superconducting regions. And indeed, we were able to show that, again, it's possible to model uh, this uh, with a Hamiltonian, which can be written in the matrix product operator language. And even the matrix dimensions do not need to be increased. So it's very similar matrices. Uh, well, they do have some non-trivial structure, which is different on the left side and on the right side of the system. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, we find that the calculations are still feasible. And uh, we started to explore this system. So it, it's a bit, a bit difficult because there's a large number of parameters to tune here. But uh, we already are familiar with some basic properties. Uh, for instance, we were able to already show that uh, there are indeed uh, two singlet states in this system. Uh, the, imp the important difference with respect to the condo problem is that even if the device is completely left-right symmetric, uh, so this is the parameter set we took here, there is still a splitting between uh, the two states and that's simply because uh, when you have a real, uh, so Anderson-like impurity in the center of the device, uh, you actually get different wave functions depending on whether this uh, the, the wave function for this additional electron has a, a node or an antinode uh, at the central position of the system. And this leads to an energy splitting. So things are different, but still we do recover these multiple states. Uh, and yeah, uh, and also the interpretation is quite clear. So this is the bound Bogolubov state, which is either in uh, anti-symmetric or the symmetric uh, superposition uh, of being in, on one or the other side of the system. So this is what concerns the singlets and the, the perhaps even more interesting thing is uh, what is the fate of the doublet states and do we have a condo uh, overscreened doublet? Uh, the important thing is that when you split a Cooper pair in one of the uh, Hamid, uh, one of the superconductors, uh, only one of the spins will bind to the to the impurity spin, uh, whereas the other Bogolubov uh, quasi particle will just be 
completely decoupled. So this is not what we want because this uh, Bugulubo quasi-particle costs energy and does not bind to an impurity anyhow. So the question is how do we transfer this extra remaining electron, or well, not really an electron, it's really a Bugulubo quasi-particle, uh, to the other side of the system? And of course, here, uh, in the presence of charging energy, we have the liberty of tuning uh, the favored electron number. And indeed, uh, one can play with this degree of freedom. And uh, so this is the, yeah, this is the regular uh, doublet state, uh, which is obtained uh, when we tune the system to even number of electrons in the superconductors. Uh, so you see here the, uh, the spin-spin correlations are very weak, so basically, indeed, uh, we can really say that this is a decoupled doublet state. But then we can, for instance, do this kind of tuning, so we tune both of the uh, quantum dots to have an extra electron in them. And indeed, in this case, we obtain spin-spin correlations for the ground state of the system, uh, which actually do correspond uh, to what you would expect for a Hubbard trimer in the small uh, limit, so in the limit of small t over u, uh, which is exactly what we wanted to obtain uh, for uh, what is expected of an uh, overscreened u Shiba Rusino doublet. Okay, um, so basically uh, my time is up, and also I cannot reveal too much uh, of. Uh, of this ongoing investigation, so I will just uh, at this point jump to the conclusion. Uh, and uh, basically, the main message is that now we have the methodology to study the full problem uh, of this type. So uh, problems where we have an interacting quantum dot and interacting superconducting island with finite charging energy, uh, and we are able to take uh, the hybridization. Uh, into account without any approximation. So this allows us to also incorporate all of the physics of the exchange uh, interactions, including uh, the uh, condo screening and all of uh, all of the different uh, super exchange uh, interactions. And the method works in all parameter ranges and is essentially exact. I mean, exact for a given problem size. Also, we now know that we are able to extend this to, for instance, to the two-channel uh, situation. And in principle, although we have not studied this uh, very carefully, we think we should be able to also incorporate uh, two impurity problems. Uh, also, what we have very recently, just a few days ago, uh, realized is that we can also incorporate spin-orbit coupling. Uh, in the superconducting region. Uh, again, in this scheme, uh, I think with uh, only small increase in the matrix dimensions. Also, I can mention that uh, in, with this methodology, we can also study time-dependent problems using TDVP. And this applies to both uh, real-time and imaginary time evolution of these states. And uh, yeah, and uh, the most active research direction right now is to ch study new physics in the two-channel case, uh, especially focusing on the doublet states and all of the physics, new physics uh, which is expected from the two-channel condo Hamiltonian. And uh, yeah, if you want to read up, uh, we now have two preprints out. Uh, one is on the focusing really on the these technical things uh, and just showing some. Uh, phase diagrams for the basic problem, uh, and this is an uh, experimental collaboration with uh, the Copenhagen group uh, where we actually study uh, actual devices to show that this methodology really is applicable to this class of uh, Hamiltonians. Okay, thank you for your attention. Interesting uh, results that you showed. So uh, I, as this uh, seminar to uh, the uh, question phase. Anyone wants to question? I have, I have a question. I, I was, uh, yeah, Luis, Luis, uh, very quick. 
uh, which is uh, from your host tech. Uh, go ahead. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, very, very nice talk, Rock. Um, very interesting results. A lot of, lot of work. Yeah, thank uh, you. My question is just, you know, very basic question regarding the Richardson model that you, you wrote the model with a alpha as a parameter, but then later you always refer to delta. And now my question is, uh, at some point you have to do some kind of mean field and in BCS, when mean field is done, usually we lose, you know, the, the particle number is a good quantum number, but there you still need to have this charging energy term which has, you know, the, the number of electrons in, in that island as a good quantum number. So how, how, do you, how do you treat that? How do you relate delta and alpha and how do you do the mean field and keep the number of electrons? Okay, case? so uh, first thing uh, is that we don't do any mean field. We really solve the full problem. And uh, so only alpha is the parameter to the calculation. And uh, so we solve the problem in the absence of the impurity to calculate delta. So what, we know what is the relation between alpha and delta. Uh, also, in principle, we know what it should be from BCS theory, but uh, it turns out uh, that uh, uh, these devices are already in the regime where the weak coupling BCS theory uh, for relating alpha to delta is not such uh, an excellent approximation. So we find that it's better to really do it numerically. Okay. Uh, so, all right. So, and a uh, quick question on a two channel case. Uh, you show that the plot where you have the the non fermi liquid fixed point for small delta, and then it, you know the the energy difference opens up for large delta. That one. So yeah. is is that any 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 non fermi liquid physics for large delta there or? Uh, yeah, no, not really. I mean. Uh, by large delta, how large do you mean? Uh, really, in this right-hand part of the yeah. This plot? Yeah, not, well, I don't know. So maybe this behavior here is definitely uh, some remnant of the non-fermi liquid behavior. So in this sense, yes. So, uh, so uh -huh. yeah, maybe, maybe one point is that if I would change if I would break this symmetry, uh, this diagram would look quite different. Okay. And uh, so, yes, in this sense, I would say that, yes, even in this region, there are some remnants of, uh, of, the, of the new physics which are brought about by the symmetry of the problem. Okay. Yeah. Because, because the experiments are, are in more or less that region, right? Yes, yeah, 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 sure. Yeah. All right. Great. Thank you. Very nice talk. Any more questions? I have a question. I was I was uh, wondering before you talked about two channel uh, condom. Uh, I was wondering that to measure the conductance, you need to couple an extra bit. Mm -hmm. Yes. The, uh, the channel, the the, uh, the superconducting island is already. Spinning the impurity, wouldn't that automatically lead to a two channel condo already? And you try to measure the conductance? Uh -huh, just, yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah. Uh, so, what you're saying is just the fact that you have a metal here. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, you would. Yeah, let me think. Um, Yes, in, in, in principle, yes, yeah. Similar to what uh, uh, Good Haber Gordon did, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it would be, I mean, this is a regular method, metal, so this drain region. So it would be a very asymmetric case where you have no gap on one side and gap on the other one. Uh, but yeah, you, it's a good point. Uh, in If one would increase uh, this coupling through tuning V1, one could tune to some regime which would be affected by the presence of the extra channel, yes. Uh, this has not been done. Okay. But, uh, 
in principle. In principle, yes. That would be interesting because you would be screening with a superconductor and with a regular metal. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah, 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 good suggestion. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. So, th there's a long to do list already. It's a very rich uh, system. There's yes. Of, uh, there's a lot of uh, physics there. Uh, and I am sure that Edson wants to ask a question about the spin orbits. <laughs> yeah, by the way, I, nice I, talk. You Thank you very much. Yeah, are you going to? Uh, you can do. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, um, my question, my question actually was uh, a little bit more, a little bit more technical. I will, I'll leave the spin orbit question for you, George. Okay, so, you. so have you, uh, as far as I understood, you applied the, the the time dependent variation principle to evolve in the imaginary imaginary time, right? Uh, yeah, the, the, actually, yeah, the, this is exactly what we have done recently. Uh, so uh, the reason why we studied that was uh, because we wanted to calculate the, uh, the dynamical charge susceptibility. Right, but how, how important, because you need to calculate the, the lowest uh, energy spectrum, at least few uh, excited space, how many of those you need uh, to get a, a nice spectrum? Uh -huh. Okay, so this is now really a question about TDVP. Uh, so what you do in T TDVP, uh, I mean, there are different versions of TDVP, but there is one which was uh, developed just recently. I think that's a 2020 paper, I believe. Uh, I can look up the reference. And uh, the point is that they show that this is possible to do even in presence of long-range interactions, which our Hamiltonian has. And yeah. uh, there are some technical tricks. Uh, so you, you need to do some Krilo expansions. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I'm not really maybe an expert on that. Uh, but th this is known, and th there's even an open source pub, uh, implementation of that on GitHub. Right, but my 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 question is: if you if if you uh, do imaginary time evolution, your your first excited state. So in principle, you presumably you could be able to calculate the dynamical susceptibility, for instance. Yeah. But how, <laughs> okay. how many how many of those states do you need? So because okay. to get this state, you need the MRD, and getting high energy states is not easy. Yeah, okay, so I see what you're asking. Yeah, so basically, really your question is about how does the bond dimension grow with increasing uh, imaginary time? And uh, the answer to that is that, uh, yeah, it is difficult to go to long times. And um, also, of course, the the lower the excitation energy to the first excited state in the same uh, quantum number subspaces, the more difficult it becomes. Uh, so it's possible to do something, and we're trying to optimize this, but uh, it is very difficult, yes. Mm -hmm. So th th that's, that's a fair answer. So this is an indication, indication that entanglement has increased in the system, right? Because yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So the the even the ground state has uh, quite high bond dimension because this is a Hamiltonian with long range interaction. So we need to go to bond dimensions of the order of thousands. Okay. So th th these are, num yeah, yeah. So these are numerically difficult uh, calculations even for the ground state. I see. Mm -hmm. And for the excitations, of course, it's even more uh, demanding. But we are able to, to we are able to calculate uh, something like tens or up to a hundred of excitations uh, so in, in just brute force approach. That, that it's possible to do that. All right, good, thank you. So this is actually just to uh, complete my uh, uh, how say my reasoning. So this is some regime you can definitely cannot apply to uh, Zook. Suzuki Trotter approach because Suzuki Trotter approach doesn't allow you to evolve uh, in time 
with Hamiltona that have long range. Yeah, uh, yeah, that, that that's my that's my non-expert understanding. Yes, okay. you really need something like TDBP for that. Okay, good. Thank you. So, uh, I have I have the uh, in orbit question. I, I may be completely off on that, but doesn't the quantum wire that was used has this in orbit interaction? Definitely, yeah. yeah. So that, that, that's the only point where we were not able to get good agreement with the experiment. Uh, that, that's in the regime where the magnetic field is so large that uh, uh, basically the triplet states uh, become uh, enter the story and uh, then you have a repulsion between singlet and triplet and this is not captured in our calculations. And for that reasons, we, we get we get crossing of levels, whereas in the experiment they see that they become pinned. And uh, the other the other question is, I was uh, I am curious about these uh, single particle levels. They get frozen mm -hmm. regarding superconductivity, but they they are available for excitation, right? So you have a mixture of over the above quasi particles and um, yes, yeah, 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 kind of, yeah. So you don't have only over the above quasi particles as excitations. You have electrons too that come from this uh, this single level, uh, singly occupied levels. Yeah, no, but these single occupied levels cost a lot of energy because each time you block a level, it will cost you of, of the order of delta in energy. Okay, okay. Yeah. So, uh, so the okay, okay. Yeah, so the one which only has one is basically the Bogolubo excitations, and so then you have also higher excitations. Uh, but basically, the understanding that we have from the BCS theory is quite adequate to understand uh, the behavior of this problem. Unless you get to the regime of very small number of levels, or if alpha is large. Because then you have both Einstein condensate, and then again, things are different. So, um, any more questions? Uh, uh, I do have an additional question. Uh, uh, sorry, yeah. sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, since, since, uh, since in the experiment, they they have the north interaction and also strong magnetic field. So with all these ingredients, uh, we, I know that the people from, from Copenhagen, they have reserved, presumably reserved uh, Majorana bound state would be, would be the case that this approach is able to uh, to find some signature of that in your calculation? What, what is the limitation? I, yeah. I couldn't see. I mean, properly speaking, uh, in, in this... Um, okay, let me think. So, yeah, it's a, it's a tricky question. Uh, so, the point is that the way we plan to uh, incorporate spin orbit coupling in this uh, in our Hamiltonian is a bit ad hoc. So we will add uh, interlevel terms which correspond to the spin triplet mixing, and, uh, and then we also will include the magnetic field. So basically, your question is: uh, Does this reproduce the same physics as you would in 1D uh, geometry uh, uh, for a model in real space. Because our model is formulated in orbital space. And, uh, but, but I guess... You actually, need... I, I would expect that maybe the answer, so very tentatively, is yes. Because this is only a change in basis. And if the, and if, yeah, and, and uh, if it's only a question of basis, uh, then in principle, that regime would be contained in our calculations. But it, it would be, because we are not working in local space, we would have uh, 
some kind of Majorana fermion, but it would be encoded in orbital language, not in real space as end modes. So maybe there would be a question of how exactly to interpret the results. Uh, uh, but yeah, yeah, in principle, yes. And uh, the point is that this spinning of singlets and triplets is precisely what has been claimed uh, by uh, experimental groups to be a telltale sign of the emergence of uh, Majorana regime. And uh, now the question is, are we reproducing the same in a different language or is this genuinely different uh, behavior? And the question is, what does the quantum dot do to that? So, yeah, I think these are valid questions uh, that, uh, yeah, we definitely plan to explore in the coming yeah, months or years. Yeah, yeah but you, you, in that case, uh, to get the Majorana zero mode, you need to go to lower density to begin. So you need to uh, shift your conduction band. Right? We can do that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. so the input in our calculation is how many electrons we, we put in the yeah. system, which corresponds to tuning uh, chemical potential. But yeah, yeah. yeah. In principle, we are, we are able to do that. I would be interested to see the results. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, just, to mention, just to mention here that Rafael Costa uh, made a comment here that may interest to Edson, who was asking about the temporal dynamics. He says that uh, he gives a reference of a paper uh, that has uh, uh, that uh, talks about temporal dynamics. So anyone who is interested okay, in yeah. the reference this year. Uh, so yeah, okay. uh, Thank you for the reference. Sure. So, uh, if uh, there are no questions, we should uh, thank Peter again for the very nice talk. Thank you very much, Rock. And uh, yeah, my my pleasure. Thank you. And, uh, yeah. So everybody is thanking. Uh, <laughs> uh, so thank you very much, and uh, I will send you an email later asking for the slides. That, so we can post. Okay. Uh, we can post with the uh, video. You know, okay. Sure. Yeah. 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 No problem. Okay. okay. So yeah, it was nice seeing you, and uh, yeah, I, I hope we meet in person sometime in future yeah. or planning, near future, hopefully. <laughs> we are planning another school. Uh -huh, I see. The, uh, once we manage to get rid of this president that we have. <laughs> This is my. I have, I have a little business to solve before inviting yeah. you to to another to do to another school. Okay. All right. I think that Thank you, Luis. Yeah, Luis is saying. Uh, yeah. Okay. Bye. See you. Bye. Bye. Bye.